morning and welcome. My name is Latanya Thompson. We are the program of service and community committee of CAF. Let's get the table um, board members and for those in the audience with some housekeeping items. For those in the public, please keep your participation on mute. For those on the phone, use pound means after six to mute and unmute. And we'll hear comments first from the board and then from the public by raising your hand. Our purpose is to advance the justice for investment and protect community investment. Here's some of our responsibilities. Recommend program related policies around both existing and new funding opportunities with a focus on evidence practice, local, regional, and national innovation and recommendations for implementation. Engage providers to educate CAF and our committee members about their work, outcomes, needs, and recommendations. Promote a structure for an implementation of a comprehensive need assessment for the county reentry population. Was working and was needed to inform future program recommendations and funded allocations. Participate in program and service related RFP development process and panel by assignment and committee chair and our CAF OER. We are grateful to those who are members of this committee and so appreciate your time commitment. Now to our agenda. Um, Latanya, I can do roll call to establish form if you like. Yes, to do roll call. Latanya Thompson. Here. Ozzy Carter. Present. And Raina Moore. Present. Okay, all board members are present. Um, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, um, Latanya, the three yeah. of you? Okay. <laughs> my name is Latanya Thompson, and this is my first year on my um, My name is Rena Moore, and this is also my first year on My name is Ozzy Carter. This is my third year on staff. Okay, Latanya, I can go ahead and ask the members that are on virtually, if you like. Yes, you can do that, Molly. Okay, so um, we have uh, Crawford Carpenter on the line. You're muted, Car Crawford. We'll come back to you, Crawford, because you're still muted, okay? We have Jenna Evans. Good, good morning, everybody. Jenna Evans, Office of Ed, Game Plan for Success, Reentry Program. Okay, and then we have Jill Ray. Hi, Jill Ray with Supervisor Anderson's office. Okay, and then we have Crawford Carpenter. Crawford Carpenter, I'm a board member of CAB in my last year. Okay, and then we have Christina Jackson. Hi, everybody. This is Christina Jackson with the Office of Reentry and Justice. Okay, and I am Monique Tate with the Office of Reentry and Justice also. Okay, let's go ahead, Latanya. You can go to the next item. At this time, do we have any announcements? Any public comments or any um, other items that are not on the agenda that we need to discuss on you today? If not, we're going to move on to approval of the minutes from our last meeting on May 18, 2023. If you have not had the opportunity, please look over the minutes from last month. Uh, I'm having a really hard time hearing the room. Latanya, okay. so maybe speak up a little. Okay, can you hear me now? A little better. It still sounds kind of distant. Latanya, maybe you guys can bring that speaker um, a little closer. I, I thought it was close enough, but maybe bring it a little closer as you speak. That might help. Can you hear me now? That's better. Okay. 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 Let's just do a quick test to make sure you can hear everybody. Can you say something, Rita? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me, Ozzy? Yes. Okay, thank you. Perfect. 
Okay, looking for that motion. I'd like to make a motion for the approval of our minutes of regular action from May 18th. I second the motion. Okay, so I'm going to repeat who made the motion and who seconded it just for the record. So Ozzy made the motion and Rena made a uh, second the motion. And maybe if you guys could state that when you uh, when you state that just for the record, because there'll be other people helping with the agenda. So um, Latanya, you can ask if there are any public comments. Any public comments at this time? Okay, seeing no public comments, Latanya, would you like me to um, call the vote? Call the vote. Okay, so uh, Latanya, um, I didn't hear you. Did you hear you, me? Yeah, so did you uh, say yes or aye for the vote? Okay, and then um, Rena? Yes. And Ozzy? Ozzy, yes, can you hear me? Yes. It, it is a little choppy, you know, I th think that might be it, what Jill was referring to, it's a little choppy uh, intermittently. So, uh, but yes, yeah, so motion carries on the minutes. So um, Latanya, you can go to the next item. Okay, so the next item is to finalize the 2023 PNS survey question. It's attachment two, page seven through eight. We're going to start with the in custody participants. Okay, so um, I'm going to go over the recommendation survey questions, and then we're going to look at the comment from the last one to see if we can move forward on this one. Um, so the recommendation survey questions for CC jail population is and in which facility are you currently staying? Which of the following describes your situation? Please choose the race and ethnicity that you most closely identify with. Please choose the gender that you identify. And then under gender, there's a comment. We'll need to consider how racist questions so is both inclusive and accessible. I'm referring to Eve as um, Eve says a gender other than center, female, or the male, non-binary. Um, so we're going to discuss, we'll come back to this after I review all the other questions. Um, just make sure that we cover everything. The next thing we have is, what is your current age group broken down by age? Do you have any of the following health condition or disability? We list those. And then another that we're going to review is, what is the most critical area or need you, you have absolutely? The next question is, what is the greatest challenge you face as you prepare to return home? What are the areas to reaching your personal goals? What support or resources would you need to reach your goals? Please name the program, service, and organization you are most familiar with that offers resources in the area of your need. And then the last question is, what supported service do you think are most needed either in the jail setting or in the community? Please describe. So we can go back to number four and to review it on another way that we can ask the question. But Tanya, can I make mention of something? Can you hear me, Latanya? Yes. Okay. So let me just mention that um, we do have a hand raised. So Jill Ray has her hand raised. And then Christina Jackson is also on the call and then Patrice is in, in the room now as well. So keep in mind that this is last month, you all went through how to change the questions up. And then this is what the evaluation team, along with Patrice, they've um, made some revisions based on your meeting from last month. So it's up to you all how you, how you wanna handle it. If you want to take Jill's comment at this time, or if you would like Christina or Patrice to give input on the changes that were made. So it's really up to you how you'd like to move forward. Yes, I'm going to have Patrice um, interject on this information, and then we'll go to Jill's um, question. Okay. Yeah. So um, the only thing I will add just in terms of the actual questions here is that um, 
you know, the uh, both Christine and Denise and myself, we kind of went through this and you'll see on the side certain comments that we'd like to get your feedback on as well. So there are certain questions here uh, with regards to how we can make, maybe better phrase certain um, questions. I think some of like the gender one, number four, E, I think we could kind of figure that out internally, but overall, for today, if you feel that the structure of this works and if there's some other feedback that you want to give us, we can take that into account. And then today, get you guys is okay to let us as ORJ team still work through um, some of the language and then just have it ready to go to, to distribute. So that way, you know, we're not having endless meetings of you guys trying to work them, right? The, uh, uh, the survey question. That's that's one piece of it. The other piece as well is that there are a couple of questions. Let me just scroll down a little bit. I think it was maybe uh, was it nine and twelve? Which one? Thank you. Um, where we're asking? Oh, it's ten through twelve. Okay. Uh, that these might be questions um, that are suited for a focus to be answered through a focus group. So um, a separate update but connected to this is that I've been speaking with health services who has their Cal AIM initiative that they're taking that's taking place. And as part of their work, they're also seeking consumer feedback from individuals that are currently incarcerated in detention. Um, uh, uh, detention center as well as a juvenile hall. So uh, they will be hosting focus groups and sometime around July or August, I believe, and then also in January. So they agreed that they would be willing to incorporate some of these questions within that uh, their focus group questions as well and share that information with us. So if that's something that you all want to consider, we can certainly do that. That would be in addition to the um, distribution of these surveys and you know and we'll get written responses back from that. So that's another method to collect information at least on 10 through 12 potentially that where you may get more robust responses versus when someone is filling this out and you know kind of writing a narrative piece on a you know a physical copy. So the, those are some main things to highlight for you guys today. Um, and, you know, certainly happy to help you discuss. So I'm going to um, give Jill the opportunity to ask her question, and then I'll open it up for anyone else that may have questions in regards to what has been covered so far. Thanks. Um, I'm just curious, in number three, the choose the race, ethnicity, um, if there ought to be a line that says other, in case somebody doesn't identify with one of those um, race slash ethnicity. Yes, thank you, Jill, for bringing that to our attention. Um, and then the other one is, I know that there was a question on here about, um, you know, do you wanna allow people to choose multiple answers on number eight? And I would think, um, you know, I don't, particularly like those ones where you do what's the most important being number one, but maybe there's multiple areas um, where somebody might need support. So I'm, I'm thinking in that number eight list. So allowing them to select more than one of them, that can be more important than that other, correct? Yeah, like check all that apply kind of thing. Check all that apply. Perfect. Any additional information, Jill? Well, I actually have a question, Jill, on your on your suggestion here. Because I can foresee someone checking all the boxes. <laughs> you know, many people checking all the boxes. Yeah. So I mean, how often does that really happen though, Patrice? But I mean, 
you know, somebody and, might have mental health and SUD or, you know, mental health and parenting support or, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know how, given all of the issues that, you know, people struggle with how one might be, it might be mental health and housing, right? I hear you. I guess I'm saying, should we have some level of prioritization? So maybe saying select what you feel are the most, are the top three critical areas of need or top four areas of need, something like that. Yeah, I think that could do it. And then the other question that I have is if health services is going to do these surveys, um, you know, going back to familiar faces, are they um, able and willing to share that information with this group? Yeah, so they they did specify that they will not uh, conduct this specific survey. That will be standalone with ORJ. But what they will do is incorporate um, some of the survey questions in their focus group. And they will share that information with. So we did agree on sharing a lot. Thank you, Jill. So on number eight, instead of check all that applies, we will say select top three or select up to three. Uh, this is Brianna Moore. Should we put it that we like they rate it like like have a like an area where like put like one through through whatever um, on which is more important to you, like that. Jill had originally indicated that she didn't feel like we should have to prioritize it. It was a need. So I think if we could select up to three for something along that line. Um, I kind of, this is Ozzy. I kind of like the option of prioritizing which one is and how we verbalize that, which is the most important, and maybe give them three or four options. Um, but there has to be some. So um basically a ranking. How do you how do you call it, Christina? Is it I don't know what's the specific scale name, but basically they would of all of these options, they would rank what they feel would be the top three, four, five most critical areas or top three, top, let's use top three. Let's just go with this as a question. But they, they could, you could give them these options and you ask them um, to select three of what they feel is the most critical area and then rank them of um, level of importance to them. So if they're selecting employment, housing, and mental health, they may select employment as their top, as number one, um, mental health as number two, and then housing as number mm -hmm. three. And this is all, if it's something that's not listed, we have to have the option of other. Yeah, I'm making a few that. So yeah, I think that's fair. This is all. You guys want to talk about the verbiage of how we actually want it so that we can include it in the notes? Um, as far as words, I think it's Zazi. I think we should leave that to uh, the powers that be. Okay. I think we go around, you know, and I think that uh, we have the ability to feel capable in knowing exactly what is good and correct as far as uh, the language and then remembering that we're not looking at third grade levels, we're looking at the movie. Below that, that you can use the phone. This is what I have access to that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll definitely, because um, we'll, we'll likely, you know, these will be in a format um, where folks can fill it out on paper. And then what we'll likely do is then transfer it over into Survey Monkey. So that way it's easier for us to do the analytic backside. Um, so I'm sure we'll find a format in Survey Monkey that'll help us with the how to word it appropriately and then structure it so folks would know how to rank what they feel are their top priorities among the three or four areas of need. This is awesome. I really want to say that I really appreciate the comments that have been made to kind of like uh, really put a lot more forethought into it and to give it a little bit more depth. And also making it, you know, accessible, something that 
And I just want to thank everyone that's been involved in making it happen. <laughs> Are there any other hands raised that we can't see on before I um, address number four on the survey? I just want to come out overlooking anyone. Can you say that again? I didn't hear you if you were talking to me, Latanya. I said we can see everyone who's actually attending um, via Zoom, so I want to make sure there's no other hands um, that are raised at this time. Um, so there aren't any other hands raised at this time. Um, and so I stopped sharing so you can see the full screen. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Christina, um, can I ask, can you give us a couple of options on what would be correct politically for the number eight when we're asking them to rank in importance? Is that interesting? Oh, I'm sorry. We are okay. I'm sorry. We're going to actually um, start with number four. Um, please choose the dinner that you identify. Um, Christine, if you could please um, give us some input suggestions in regards to what's politically correct for E or is it in regards to gender? Yeah, um, so I, I took these response options from another um, county agencies uh, form, essentially. Um, I wanted to work off something that already existed. Um, but my comment here is specific to our conversation we had last month surrounding making sure the language of the survey is recognizable, understandable, and um, accessible, essentially, to those responding to the survey. So I will be honest in that I am not an expert on um, the phrasing um, surrounding, you know, gender identities in a way that, um, you know, will be the most um, accessible um, and but also inclusive and representative of all identities. Um, so that's why I wanted to highlight this in case there were thoughts, you know, uh, I wanted to hear what your thoughts were um, as members of the subcommittee too on this question. If it sounds good, we can keep it. Or maybe if we want to um, maybe phrase it in a different way. If this is something we can take back and kind of workshop a little bit more, happy to do so. Or if you feel comfortable with the way it's worded, we could leave it. Um, I just wanted to call it out for the opportunity to discuss if that was something that the subcommittee uh, felt like doing so. This is Latanya. The only thing that I've seen um, in a professional session is where you will see someone say, she, her, them. Um, yes, I don't want to do the pronoun or that's the only way that I've seen it without having a lot of knowledge and experience in that area is that a lot of people start to use the pronouns. This is Rena Moore too. Uh, the word singular, I don't know if wrong, but uh, some people might have problems understanding that. So I thought maybe we would phrase it a little bit different too. And okay. Maybe, This is all that non-binary the word is being used for those who don't have it in the box. Um, it's LGBT, LGBTQ plus. Uh, and I'm, you know, trying to remember how we want to come first to be politically correct. So that's um, questionable because some people identify as gay, some people might identify as lesbian, not really those specifically. If there is a political correct garments to use to identify these kind of things. Um, so you didn't need to. So the only distinction with that is that you have those who, who um, have a um, their sexual orientation and then you have gender identity. And so, uh, and though we typically when we identify a community, kind of lump those all together, right? You have your um, L LG, so your lesbian, gay, but then you have transgender, which is a gender identity and on and on and on. So I think in this regard here, we are looking specifically at how do folks identify um, their gender. 
and there are instances where someone does not consider themselves whether they're trans or they may consider whether they're trans female trans male or male female they do not i do not cons uh, they don't identify with just either one uh, so you have then the other terms and i think for the sake of both simplicity but then also for inclusivity we're trying to determine how do we capture those folks who do identify as non-binary or Jewish gender fluid and things of that nature. So um, we just might have to, we may want to pull on um, uh, RDA as well. That's the, uh, those are the researchers, evaluators that are supporting health services and their consumer feedback um, efforts survey collection and all of that. We may want to ask them. Um, they've seen you guys as well. That's why they did identify some of your questions. Like, yeah, we told you that in our focus group. But I can feed them again and see what recommendations they may have this specific um for that specific line. Um, and if we should if we may just break them out. It may just be um e non-binary F Gender fluid, and you know, whatever the case may be. So I agree we could list them out. Could we also add like um, others for this area so that we don't have to keep breaking it down or offending anyone by not being included and give them the option? It would have served as well as an education moment. Yeah. To see what, yeah. Uh, yeah, we could definitely have a other one. I mean, we have a preferred not to respond to. So if folks do respond and they feel like their option um, is not listed, um, then they can certainly fill it in and help us to have a better understanding. Is there any other comments in regards to number four before we move on? So what I'm going to do is, even though we're not going to go into detail, I just want to kind of just look at the numbers after to see if there's any other questions or concerns before we move on so that we can um, begin to move forward and finalize it. Um, so in regards to the um, current age, is there any common questions or are we fine for that courage and the way that we've broken it down? Everybody a moment. I have a quick question here. Um, Patrice, we put the um, age range of 18 to 25 in order to capture the Tay population. Um, do you also agree with 18 to 25 or is 18 to 24? Um, I just want to make sure we're capturing Tay. Yeah. No, I think 18 to 25 is 18 fine. 25. Okay, because I've seen 24 in other places. I just want to make sure we got that right. <laughs> Great, thanks. I think 25 is like the oldest that folks yeah. say. So I think we're still 25. Okay. Number six, are there any comments, questions about the, um, this question? Do you have any of the following health condition or disability with the word and that we capture everything in this area? Give everybody a moment to review it and the opportunity to ask a question or to comment. Yes. Jill, Jill, Jill yeah. Ray has her hand up. Sorry. Hand up. I, so this section confused me, and I'm sure it came from somewhere specific. Um, so I was just curious because it separated out medical and learning, but learning includes um, vision impairment, hearing loss, which is also medical. Um, and so I'm just as the you know, looking at who's going to be filling these surveys out and answering these questions. It just, it was a little confusing to me. Um, the sort of the, the breakdown on this. Um, yeah, no, I, I can see that. 
So we might want to take out vision impairment and hearing loss, but we could include something like dyslexia. Right. right? Yeah. And sort of and ADHD is sort of one of those wobblers. It's not necessarily a learning disability, but it, I mean, it can fall into a couple of other categories. So I'm just with this population, is that something they recognize as a learning disability? Um, so, and there's, there's autism, there's, there's a variety of things that could be plugged into learning, I suppose. Um, only because it's, it's, it's my parameters of learning disability, uh, vision and loss of hearing loss. And it depends on your age. It also depends on other people. So it depends on how people read that. I can't, I, I'm not, I have learning disability. I have a learning issue. I have a skin that I want to slap. But I can't hear that well. I can't run because I can't hear. I can slap the bag. I can see the one thing. So there's still another area that those, and I'm just putting it out there because those are part of for some of these. Ozzy, I'm so sorry. Can you repeat what you said in the beginning? I couldn't hear the audio come through. I just want to make sure I don't miss what you were saying. As a learning, um, you talked about disabilities and learning. Um, I know there was brought to the table, Jill brought to the table that vision and hearing, vision and hearing and hearing loss might not be something that we wanted to include as verbiage. And I wanted to add into that that uh, vision and hearing often are issues for people when they're learning, uh, especially individuals who don't have glasses, have them diagnosed, they can't see, they can't really read because they can't see. And a lot of them have hearing issues and from their disease and on up. But they can't learn because they can't hear. So it's kind of like that, that could be an ongoing debate on whether or not that is truly defined as a disability. And I was saying that because that has been my history in my story. I was considered disabled from vision and hearing, but at that age, but still, it's a disability. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, and I was going to say, um, should we put like a physical? Um, we put it like um, medical and like really physical disability. And that's one of the that in physical for you. Yeah, we could actually re retitle a set of medical, make it physical. Um, and this is health conditions or disabilities. So I think we could re name medical as physical and then it's for the listing of examples, diabetes, arthritis. I mean, we could put um, vision impairment there. Um, any any sort of physical ailments that might prevent some. Oh, we were kind of we were saying injuries um, affecting the ability to work or move. So we can put that. So did we want to talk about? So when I hear um, Ozzy talk and what we discussed, it sounds like more of like what would fall under um, American Disability Act. We talk about vision, we talk about hearing, kind of those things, because those, those would be, um, they would be accommodated. So even if they apply for a job under American Disability Act, they should have to find reasonable accommodation. I don't know how we want to approach or address it if we want to look at the actual diagnose or what's impacted that would fall under a disability such as hearing or vision. Well, in this case, this is self-reported, you know, or, or this is the individual themselves saying what they feel are their health issues or conditions, whether there's a diagnosis or not, that they feel um, affects them uh, or that they can name and identify. So I think in that case, we're just outlining for them what we want to see as potential health issues or disabilities that they are going to be uh, uh, you know, sharing. And then we have the other line if there's anything that we can miss. But um, I don't think we have to get into the weeds of whether or not we want to qualify it in saying any 
asking the person to share whether or not they've had a specific diagnosis of any certain condition. So for B, how would we capture that information? Because we've identified that A would be physical. Um, and then when it came to B, learning, we talked about vision and hearing. Would we just leave vision and hearing there? No, I think we should take those out. Because vision, in this case, when we're thinking about like learning this like dyslexia, like certain certain disorders and or um, and forgive me because I don't even have the right language, so I'll just be frank about that. But um, any sort of condition that would affect uh, one's, I would I would guess intellectual capabilities uh, and or cognitive. Capabilities, maybe that's the right way of saying it. Um, and so, yes, though vision impairment or a hearing loss can affect one's ability to learn, I think we're looking at it more so from a cognitive uh, standpoint. Um, Question. Yeah, this is Dante. So what would they be looking at it from when they're building up the paperwork? Because we, we're intellectualizing what they are seeing. We have to get down here because they are really how they are particularly what's really going on with them. We have to remember who they are. We meet them where they are. So are you so then suggesting that when one looks at a term such as learning disability, that they would uh, associate vision impairment and hearing loss as a learning disability? Um, it depends on how you verbalize how you simplify the question for them to even get the answer. We have to keep it as simple as possible so that they can give us the information we're looking for. And, and that's that's the that's the little nuance because if we get to vocabulary eyes, they're gonna not they're gonna be confused about how to even answer. Okay. Because how they they don't even know if they've been identifying ADHD with this level. They don't even know, you know, they're gonna people in custody, you know, they're survival mode. Okay, so they're not really in the medical thing to be diagnosed and have to have a really want the doctor to understand what they're really. I'm just trying to say keep it as simple as possible because we don't want to open and date them without intellectualizing what it should. I, I agree with you. So the way that the question is currently structured, do you have certain recommendations or suggestions for how you how it should be? Is it fine as is, or should it be given that we talked about a change in medical to physical? Um, are there and, and potentially moving um, vision impairment, hearing loss from the learning line, I think including something like dyslexia. And we can also identify, look up what are some other common, commonly known learning disabilities. We also have an other line that you feel no. Those things considered, that that is still kind of veering away from its simplicity. What recommendations or suggestions do you have on how we can simplify it further? Um, what if you just change the language to the question is, do you struggle with any of the following health conditions or disabilities? Because it seems like D and E don't really match the question that's being asked. Monique, can you update um, it to show that we're changing it from do you have any to do you struggle with? any of the following health conditions or disabilities for number six? Yes. My question is, are, are, what are the other committee members hearing as far as do we want to leave it as it is or do we want to um, include the emergency set? I 
learning challenges um, due to vision or hearing? That sounds good. Just reading more. That sounds good. I mean, we can still deal with anything else, but I think if you put like learning challenges due to, and then you can we can list like the medical condition, vision or hearing to simplify it. I like that. Just read more like that. Did you hear us, uh, Molly? Yes. Yes. Any comments, feedback on that, on B, um, putting any learning challenges such as, and then we can say vision or hearing to capture it and also simplify it. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to assume we're all on the same page and okay with this. This is you guys' survey. <laughs> you give us direction. Okay. Are you okay with your survey? So can I ask a question, Ozzy? Um, uh, Monique, can you uh, uh, tell us what we just said? <laughs> can you give us? I cannot repeat back exactly what you just said because I have it on the recording and I'm actually multitasking. So what I heard was for number six, um, do you struggle um, with any of the following health conditions or disabilities? We select all. A, medical will change to physical, such as whatever was listed there. B, learning challenges. So at first I heard learning challenges due to, and you could say due to conditions such as ADHD, vision impairment, hearing loss, et cetera. C, I heard stays as is, D, as is, E, as is, F, as is. This is Alice's question. Under B, the health challenges are they are they going to be listed out and they can check it, or is it just going to no? They just no. and then just check one that that is with their, within that parameters of ADHD and dyslexia. Yeah. About. So like if you were to like if we were to give this to you today, saying the verb has changed, um, and we're asking, do you struggle with any of these conditions? Please select all. That don't apply, they would select those based on that primary category, right? So, physical learning challenges, mental health, alcohol use, drug use, other. But what's in the parentheses, that stuff will stay. We'll make certain edits based on what you guys just said. And so, for B specifically, we will reword it to state learning challenges is due to conditions such as ADHD, vision, uh, vision impairment, he hearing loss. I would like to recommend dyslexia, if that's okay, in yeah. that listing, all right. Um, that is a common, very common learning um, um, uh, disability there. Um, and et cetera. Okay. okay. So if no other questions, we're going to move on to number seven. Um, what region or country would you be returning to? County would you be returning to? So we broke it down last week, we last month. So if you can look over that. You have a moment to look over it. Uh, this is Dr. I have a question. You was highlighted in yellow as your specific reason. Yeah, I think that's because in the version we were working on, it was um, it was a question for the partners and providers. So I think we had to change the language so it was specific to individuals returning, not to the providers, uh, that language. So that's why it was more for our tracking. So we'll we'll take that off. The highlight, I mean, we'll remove that in the survey. I think we're going to move on to number eight. 
what is the most critical area of need for you at the release? We did um, agree that we would add check all that apply. No, that we would say um, you're going to work on the you're going to work on the verbiage about prioritizing and selecting. Yeah, so we'll do that. Three. Are there any other comments before we move on in regards to number eight and the changes, corrections we've already identified for this area? Okay. Okay. Number nine. What is the greatest challenge you face as you prepare for um, to return home? And we might want to consider uh, rephrasing this question to: Do you have any concerns or worries about returning home? If so, what is your greatest concern or worry? Um, I like the way that we recommended to rephrase it. Can everyone? Hear me, I'll read up the way we're going to rephrase it over. Um, do you have any concerns or worry about returning home? If so, what is your greatest concern or worry? I think it's simple to the point and very clear. Serena, why I agree? This is all the I agree. Okay, no view. Okay, so I'm going to move on to number 10 real quickly. Um, what are the barriers to reaching your personal goals. What support or resources would you need to reach your goals? Is everyone okay with that question? Mr. Moore, I have a question. Um, can we say that um, when we first start talking about this, that these might go into uh, these questions, these three last three questions might be asked in uh, focus groups instead? Was it 10 to 12? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what were we not going to ask these questions on this survey? Is it the focus group or? So we're going to keep the questions and the focus group. Um, yes, whichever you guys decide. Um, the benefit of it, well, if for sure you you want it in the focus group, um, you're going to get more um, robust um, responses from this. Um, in the actual physical document, folks will leave. Um, you know, narrative responses, you won't know necessarily what the quality of those responses will be, but you know, um, it can certainly still be made available if you wanted to see what um, a, a large number of folks might respond to those questions. But I'll leave it up to you guys to decide whether you want to. From here, um, or uh, and just have them as part of questions that we'll ask during the focus group. This is what I think it would benefit us to have it on the survey as well as the focus group to get the conversation started on paper and then to have the focus group to ask clarifying questions and to dive deeper with. Serena Moore, I agree. I think we should keep our questions. Okay. Are there any comments, questions about number 10 before we um, address number 11? If you can please review number 11 and let me know if everyone is okay with the verbiage. I'll give you a moment and I'll look around the world as well as online to see if there's any views. Great. Moving on to number 12. What support service do you think are most needed either in the jail settings or in the community? Please describe. Are we okay with the way that that is worded? Any comments, questions, feedback? If not, that is the complete form. And based off of what we covered and discussed today, um, I think there were just minor corrections. And the, the correction that we're going to actually look at, which is going to be more in detail, we're going to have Patrice actually do the work with it on it so that we feel like this is finalized. 
I have a quick comment. I don't, sorry, I don't know if you've asked for public comment yet um, on number 12, if that's okay. Your question? Yeah, it, it just it's just more of a comment. I don't know if we necessarily need to make any changes to number 12. It's just a caution in that um, if we're asking the areas uh, or the supportive services needed either in the jail or in the community, if we get responses to that, we may not be able to tell whether or not people are speaking to the jail setting or the community if they're listing out certain responses. So just... Um, just want to put that out there that if we're asking this or that, you know, the jail setting or the community, if individuals are listing out the supportive services, we may not know whether they're referring to in the jail or in the community based off the way the question's worded. So I don't know. I mean, I think we're going to get a lot of rich information from the survey. I don't know if we need to change question 12, the wording of it, but I just want to put that caution out there um, in the way it's currently worded. Please describe and put it in the front. Please describe what supportive service um, you need, either in a jail state or community, so that when they describe it, it would give us clarity. Or do you want to leave it as a two part? Ask a question and then ask them to describe. Would that provide us the information without it? So I think what Christina's calling out here is even if you get it that way, that what will still happen is they may say, uh, for example, uh, we need more training on financial literacy. And they may be okay, something that they need. And so we wouldn't know, are they saying financial literacy? Because they did answer it. They did answer the question, but we don't know in which, in which setting that they feel that this is needed. Now, they could. What you what you needed it won't. <laughs> True. But, True. But, but I think for our purposes, um, especially as in the future you guys continue to make certain recommendations um, around funding or just uh, different types of programming that you'd like to see, having the actual um, folks in the jails that are then able to say, well, actually, we need we really need financial literacy classes in the jails. And then we can that 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 has a whole totally different, you know, mm -hmm. kind of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm, I'm trying to phrase here? That that will help shape whatever your future recommendations will be and who you're speaking to versus something where they're like, we want to see, we need more financial literacy classes in the community. Well, that just might simply be talking with the CBOs that are currently doing employment or work or whatever and see if they do financial literacy classes you know, versus what is up currently provided. I'm not saying that there isn't any of that happening, Jay. I don't know um, if there's anything specific to that, but just use that. Thing. So, the, and, and that would give us the opportunity to go deeper in the focus group because this will become a focus group as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Just remind me, I'm a, Question. Should we break up number 12 into two questions? Like one be what supportive services do you need in a jail? And the third question would be what supportive services do you need in the community? We can do it that way. I, 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 I would totally agree with that, especially if you're going to leave 10 through 12 in the survey for folks to fill out. At least in the focus group, you can structure, you know, whoever's the facilitator, structure these questions or structure how they're asking and facilitating the discussion to get that level of detail. Mm -hmm. But when it's on paper, you know, it's really at the whim of the individual. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, I, I like the idea. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, in the number 12, we're going to break down to, um, only include to break it down to make it two questions. So it would say the same thing twice. The only difference is the first question will say jail setting, and then we'll ask the same question for number 13 and replace jail setting with community. Okay, I got that. Thank you. No other um, information input regarding this? Okay, so we would have to meet again to on. No, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it is minor. Well, yeah, I think we'll be.
Well, so you could, I should, okay, sorry. Okay. Sorry, I got hit on myself. Um, you guys can decide either to allow us to make these changes and bring it back for another review and, and then a, a final vote, or you can make a motion today that based on today's discussion, you all approve this version of the survey with the edits that were discussed and that or you know, tell ORJ make those changes and work with Sheriff's Office to get those surveys back. <laughs> so I'm gonna go around and ask the board get their input. This is a time and I feel with the minor changes that we made in a lot of the work that we've already discussed and are we had them over to the I'm fine with us moving ahead to um, finalize it and have and have them report. Who's reading where I do? You're so efficient, Rena. Appreciate it. <laughs> I agree. And can we have a vote? And, and will we make the motion? Are we making the motion now? I'm going to I'm looking to make sure there's no hands um, raised, and then I can make the motion. So what we so you're chairing today, so you will call for a motion, um, and someone can move, and someone can second. Then you'll open it up for discussion. We'll see if anyone has hands raised, and then um, ask them to call a vote. Okay, I'm just going to make sure. Excuse me, this is Monique. Um, so this is a two part. Patrice, would they vote on A and B together, or should should they discuss the a, B at this time, or should they just go on and vote on the A? The end. Vote on approving the survey questions. Okay. And this. Um, I'm just looking at this. The probably wording not correctly. Um, the discussing next steps, there's nothing to vote on. Say that again. Discussing next steps for distribution, there's nothing to vote. The, the, yeah. Okay, so it's just the voting on the A. Okay. So the question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to call to motion for approval of the survey question. Mr. Gordon Carter, I would like to make a motion based on today's discussion for the approval of our in custody survey questions and moving forward from the approval. We have it also uh, forwarded on to ORJ to implement this position to MJ. Bring more effect the motion. And I'm going to open it up for discussion. So, Monique, can we call to vote? Sure. Mm -hmm. Latanya Thompson. Yes. Raina Moore. Yes. And Ozzie Carter. Yes. Motion carries. All right. Cavs first in custody. <laughs> okay. So um, the next thing on the agenda is to discuss and finalize questions for CEO and site visits. Oh, before you move on with that, so the next, in terms of next steps for um, distribution of the surveys, um, after we um, make the edits, um, we will then um, be in touch with uh sheriff's office to sort of map out a timeline um to do this because we'll have to factor in not only the amount of time it will take to distribute the surveys and then to collect them but then also the amount of time it will take for us to do physical entries into survey one e so that we could do an analysis okay so um hopefully we can have a more a thorough update by your next meeting um, to let you know what is the preliminary plans of the All right. So next on the agenda is to step and finalize questions for CBO and site visits.
Did have a question on? Um, I can mention something about that, Latanya. So you don't have the questions included in the agenda, but um, I was thinking that you all were going to discuss questions that you would have brought today, or you can come up with questions now. Because I think the first round, when you originally started talking about this, um, I think you all were had emailed me some information, but yes, we don't have an attachment for that, but today would be where you would actually discuss it in case you brought questions or come up with questions now for possible um, questions for its CBO and visit. Let's open it up for questions so that we can start working on um, finalizing the question for the CBO. Now I'm going to go to my emails to pull up the one that will be missing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I just have some. Uh, I don't have all of them. Okay. You have them all compiled? Or you I was in agreement with the one that Monique sent out, so I didn't add any additional. Yeah. Okay. Monique, do you have the email link? Are you able to pull it up for us? Um, I can't pull it up because I we didn't agendize it per se, the attachment, but I can, um, I mean, I could try to read them off. I could find my email and maybe read off. Is that correct, Patrice? So, yeah, so just for um, sake of context for the rest of the uh, folks that are on, these are interview questions that um, the committee members are deliberating on as they um, begin to schedule their site visits. So, um, you know, you're more than welcome to go through those, but they're generally speaking, it's just for information gathering as you are at the sites, um, meeting with them, learning more about their program, like that. And so uh, if you guys would like to kind of discuss broadly what some of those questions are touching on, even if you um, don't have the, Specific questions to discuss. Okay, this is Ozzy. I'd like to open it up talking about some of those questions. And primarily, I would like to focus on uh, I did have an opportunity to review some input questions. Um, and I would like to really focus on the ones dealing with disability since that's one of the pillars that we're going to really try to focus on uh, when dealing with the CEOs and exactly. How they are, I'm going to achieve correct verbiage, how they deal with individuals that have disabilities, whether they're obvious, have been acknowledged, or whether they have not. And it's something that they can see within their, in their interviews and talking with their clients. So that was something, one of the questions for dealing with families where disability is obvious, how are you approaching the situation specifically? And when not, when not at an additional diagnosis, for example, a person comes and it's very evident that there's a disability, where it might be a learning disability, where it might be but there's something going on and it hasn't been, it's not within the context of their, any of the paperwork or any of the things that they uh, are having knowledge. And how that, how, how is that dealt with? And how do you acknowledge that? How, what type of lens? We use uh, specifically, I can put the bias that comes into that play as well. Are you identifying things you visually? Are you sensitive to the needs specifically? And how are you identifying it? And how are you uh, reading with that in your client and representing that client? Yes. Um, and some of the other questions are. Um, what has been your greatest challenge since COVID-19 restrictions ended? Um, we, that's one of the questions that we asked. Another question was, um, and you kind of hit on it, what new innovation ideas have been implemented in serving those with disability? We're curious in, um, about that, making sure that the needs of the client are being met. Some of the things that we have discussed in the past, making sure that it's wheelchair accessible to be able to um, enter the building, that the doors are wide enough for them to enter in with their wheelchair, as well as being able to utilize the bathroom and other things within the building facility. 
So that question was, I'm sorry, can you restate that question? <laughs> so um, with the innovation ideals have been animated and serving those with this. I just wanted to add on to that because uh, that tail end that um, I heard is important as far as not being relevant to what we're supposed to be doing mm -hmm. and actually a big science with measuring and making sure that they're not going to measure. Well, <laughs> I can say some of that might not be in our realm of uh, our jurisdiction to kind of like pinpoint, but maybe so much more, much more to deal with actual person. Okay, maybe a question. <clears throat> Excuse me. How many individuals have you encountered that might have come in a simple or both of you? That could be something else. How do you facilitate that? Yeah, you can even access your building on uh, what you're accessible, right? Yeah, I mean, no. it's, yeah, that's where you start going into it. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. It may be perceived as okay, this is more like a kind of mm -hmm. Okay, nice check type of thing. And that's you don't want to go down that road. But what you do want to do is <laughs> at the very least, um, I like I like to the, the question around essentially once you've identified once the person has self reported that they do have a disability or they're having some uh, challenges, uh, what resources are then made available to them or how do they you know accommodate or is their program already structured yeah. in a way that takes into account different learning styles different learning disabilities things of that nature um and then that will eliminate you know how they make adjustments when they do um, encounter um some of the disabling condition or even if they have relationships and partners with other organizations that deal with the So do we need to work on number two or can we leave it as is? Because I kind of add it based off the previous conversation. The um, question actually is what new innovative ideas have been implemented in serving those with disability? I think you could maybe re, re, uh, state that as, um, well, one, you want to know. All right. So in order to say what new, you want to know first. Um, in what ways do they help support clients that have that have this? You know, um, and so again, this is kind of like information gathering, so you can understand where folks are at in that space or regard. You, there may be organizations or programs that aren't implementing any specific innovative, you can make a innovative, whatever that might be, mm -hmm. innovative strategy for. Uh, clients with disabilities because maybe they already have a really great partnership with an organization that is already doing some of that great work. So I would say um, focus more on what do they do do um, and, and or what partnerships they may already have in that space versus the uh, innovations in that space. Now, but some of these organizations that's not necessarily their forte, they know they need to accommodate because you your program is essentially open to all sorts of folks, right? Mm -hmm. um, but their main focus might be on employment or, or failing to get or whatever the case may be. Those challenges might impact how well someone can take to the program, but it's not their main focus. It only gets better. Okay. That makes sense. Okay, so we will work on that question. So that's more about what they do and what partnership they have versus um, asking something. And then we'll definitely ask what ways do you support clients with disability first and then how to lead to the next one. Maybe did you want to make the next question? Sure. Um, Serena Moran, uh, when dealing with families with, where disability is obvious, how are you approaching the situation? Typically, we're not an original labor. Uh, uh, it says, when dealing with families where a disability is obvious, how are you approaching the situation? Specifically, when not an original labor. When a, um, a disability is obvious, but there's no diagnosis. So, again, a staff person, a program staff person, may or may not know. That is 
you know. Um, they're not in the, you know, I guess I'm trying to figure out what's what's at the core of that question that you're trying to get at. What's that the was my question. Yeah, what's the, what's, the, what, what, what's the core of the information you're trying to gather? Is it how they support the families of someone that might have a disability? What type of recommendation? Are you looking at the full picture of this person? You, it's not a diagnosis, they have a disability. If you indicate you're the intake person, you're having a conversation with them. What are your recommendations? How well are you suited to uh, approach their need, even though it hasn't been specified? Would you take the lead on that and make a suggestion? Do you have uh, providers that you can refer them to without being um, obvious or people are real sensitive about this? Sure. So, so being able to articulate and then provide the service this person might need mm -hmm. outside of what they're there for. So that might be something where you, you're wanting to learn how then do um, how is their case management style, so to speak, once they've identified this person had, or the person has self-identified that they have a disability or a disabling condition? Is that? They haven't identified. You have. You're sitting there and you're seeing this person. Has but if I'm a case manager, I may or may not be able to identify. Other than asking the question to right. self-identify. Right. So maybe that might be the key. To answer the question, but what would I do? I would actually begin to ask the question in a non threatening manner uh, or non threatening manner of the person to find out more. To be, to, to be sensitive to needs that are not specifically expressed or identified by a person that they can't self identify because they might not do it. But if you identify your your position or whatever, and what do you do? Do you have a problem? That's the question. What do you do when the person has not self disclosed? Right. And not self identify and you're disclosed, but you do an intake to them to serve And you know that they do have a disability. There is a disability, obviously. Like what's your profile or something? Like what do you do with that? Like, how, do you, how, do you, how do you address it? How do you support that? Is that on your radar for identifying that? Because a lot of times that might not be on your radar, that might not be part of the job. That's to me, um, that is a job. That's to me, as a case manager, you would have to be careful how you ask that question because it's almost like you're indirectly questioning them in their role and responsibility by asking them, are you able to identify a person's need even when it's not self, like when, they, when they're not disclosing it to you, right? So it's more about the intake form and the way that they're answering the case. It's the way that it sounds to me. I could be wrong. Well, I don't know, just, I don't know if there's a safe way to ask that. Right. Or okay. they the person that works in the section and the person that comes in. They're, they're waiting to see something. If, if they can see there's some type of new, you know, visible, visible disability, or maybe not, you know, it's how do you identify it? What measures do you go beyond what you're asked to do? If you see someone that has an issue, and that really needs to be addressed. So I guess my whole thing on some of this is that as you, you're going to engage in conversation with the provider, the program staff, whomever it is you're, you are scheduled to meet with. And so there will be a natural flow in having some of these conversations. So my hope is that as you are thinking through your interview questions, you don't like um, limit yourself to a very rigid conversation because things will come up in discussion in terms of their process of how they serve all clients, how they, I, what questions they ask during intake, and after intake when the person is enrolled in the program and they've identified certain things along the way, how then do they, and that's more or less the substance of case management. So 
I guess that's where I'm starting to kind of go where this conversation more or less is legal grounds, not so much um, identifying the person with a disability and 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 and, and, and Once you see that an individual has certain challenges, what sort of supports then do you connect them to? What relationship to other organizations do you have? What sort of plan or does the organization have certain plans in place or what are the ones, you know, where, once something has been revealed or it comes up or maybe you're in a group setting in a class setting, you start to notice that someone is not maybe doing that well and maybe it has something to do with the learning disability versus something else, then what are the what sort of course corrections do you make? And that is the skill set of, of case management. So framing your conversation or your discussion around that will help to reveal their how they approach or what's their process that they have in place when they're dealing with folks who have different types of challenges. Right, they're going to approach something differently if someone comes into the classroom high versus someone who comes into the classroom, you know, and it seems like maybe their mood is off, you know. But they're not necessarily a clinician that will know and have health records and things of that nature to know the depth of that person's situation. They're just dealing with them in real time. So, in conversation with with pro provider staff, I think it's Especially when you want to get at the heart of well, how do you support folks with disabilities? I think if you keep it general like that, it they will they will tell you. Um, yeah. And then especially around pieces where, you know, how then or what role does the case manager or program staff play in supporting the client that might have a disability? And then also um, better connecting them with family. You know, or how do you support the family that's supporting this this individual? Right. There may be even some cases that, due to the person's um, due to certain challenges, they may or may not even be the program may not even be a fit for them, but they signed up for it. You know, so then what do you do in those sort of sort of circumstances? So I don't know if I'm helping, but all to say that hopefully, as you're thinking through your conversation with program staff, that you keep it broad and open enough so that they can share with you exactly their process and how they go because they have they deal with so many different types of scenarios with all sorts of needs and challenges for many different types of problems. Thank you. So um, we are down to our Last eight I'm minutes. sorry. I'm sorry. sorry. No, you're totally fine. We needed that information. Thank you so much, Patrice. Because what I want to ask of the board is that between now and our next meeting, that we think of some general, broad, open questions that allow them to feel safe um, to start the dialogue as well as a partnership, and that we can review those next month and kind of finalize those questions. But remember to keep them broad and open um, because the conversation will happen organically. And if I could, if I could interject something, Latanya, because I know we're it's twelve twenty three. Um, so for the questions and the visits and even the CBO presentations, that's something that can be done offline. Um, you all can email the suggestions, and or Jay can compile it and and ask if you want it to be finalized for your next meeting offline. So we can do um, the, the site visit, which is live, and then six discussions for future CEO presentation offline. And then we'll yeah, be right. You could do the suggestions uh, as far as preparing for that. And then also, due to the time constraints today, you may want to carry your work plan over unless there's something that's definitely pressing that you all want to um, talk about, or if you'd like to continue and just go over a little bit because you'll need to do talk about next steps too. We certainly can do that. Have you reached out to any of the CPOs there or schedules? 
Oh, yeah, you don't have to wait on the question to schedule you. Yeah, because right now, so here's the thing. Now we're coming into summertime. So uh, we also make themselves available, but just, you know, keep that in mind, you know, uh, summer months can be um, close to taking vacation and things like that. But I would say just try to go ahead and get on their calendars, especially if you're hoping to speak with any of the directors or program managers. Um, if your anticipation is to do a full like program tour, or you wanting to see programs in at, uh, in real time operating, do you want to sit it through a class? Like you know, think through how you actually want your site visit to be. Um, that will also help to structure what your questions will need to be too. Because uh, um, yeah, you want you want to think about all of those those pieces and try to go ahead and get on your calendar so you can. Check all that stuff. Okay, so another takeaway we're going to have is we're going to reach out to the site and get on their calendars to speak with them and to also consider what you want that to look like. You have the opportunity to sit in any class training to see what's being presented to establish a relationship. And then we can even add a later time if you need to go back and adjust the questions. With the additional information that we have from the on site visit. So we can move forward with that. So, number seven, which is a review of the 2023 work plans. Um, is there anything that you guys want to address about this? Otherwise, I will summarize what we have discussed and what our next action steps are. So we're now looking at page nine and ten, and we're on number seven for the agenda. I think our, our work plan was approved last last year. The work here, yeah, final yeah. 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 So the only thing that we're moving forward on is um, the CBO site visits and and uh, upcoming presentations. We don't have our assigned uh, right areas, organizations, yep. and um, might be something that they can we come back to us today. For the on site or for our on site. Yes, that is going to do that. When our day is open, start starting in the process. Yes. This is our next meeting is going to be in July. So we're running up against the ambassadors uh, things as well. So, uh, as uh, the mentioned, with the summer, you know, we are the right at the beginning of the summer. Now, so, I'm going to do my best to try to get uh, my appointment scheduled and at least have it booked. So, when I come in uh, next month, I will have to be able to report out that I have. I'm going to see whomever in time and be able to make that a matter of record. And then maybe by August and September. Okay. And you all have your contact um, people, point people who are the organization. You got that information? I don't know what the name of the site. Okay. I, I have some. You have some. Um, what is that going to get that? Yeah. So I, I can just say, really, can, can you scroll down, um, Monique, we'll to where they're, they're listed? Who, who has what? Who's assigned to a uh, program services for us? Um, I think it may be. I thought I saw it it's was on page 10. To certain um, organizations. I thought it was going to be listed. Yeah, I don't think it, is it. I don't think it's on the. Is it on the work plan? I remember I emailed it. It's 10. You know, we probably can't see because it's page it's right here. Page 10. I gave her my paper. Okay. Oh, page um, 10. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. CBO site visit. And then it lists. Oh, list here it. it is. Here it is. I have it. So, Tanya, um, for Center Force, you probably want to speak to Cynthia Sabala. She'll probably be your first go to. Really great um, program manager there um, for.
offer, and then you also have their legal aid. Yeah. Um, they actually have expanded now. They have a full reentry team. It used to be just one attorney back in the day. Now it's like three or four of them. Um, but certainly, I believe Rachel Holder, if I'm saying her last name correctly, is she might be out. But anyway, that reentry team. There's another one, Ocean Motley, who is newer. Um, and they could certainly be available to, to me and to talk with you. Uh, Rina, that's you, right? MWP, last time uh, Shantina was here for the, which meeting was that? Yeah, full cap. That was full cap. She's the new executive director for MWP. So we certainly do an email um, uh, exchange or uh, uh, intro for you on that one. Uh, and then uh, Lau, um, there's Mimi and Mai, who um, are over the uh, AD uh, Common program there as well. Uh, Ozzy, do you have your folks? These are easy people. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you got your people. So, anybody that, so for Latanya and Rena, if you're like, I don't know where to go or who to talk or whatever, she just shoot me a quick email. I'll do a quick intro, let them know that you all are interested in. Uh, towards their program and want to um, just do an informational interview to learn more about um, their work. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Are there any last minute um, comments, questions? Looking on. If not, we will adjourn. If not, our next meeting is July the 20th. And if no other questions, comments, then we can answer them. Thank you 